Anything I just sent you a video I want to show as well. I sent you a link to a video I want to show. I sent you a link to a video I want to show. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's also recording. Okay. Apparently, so you okay. Hello, hello. Hello, this is uh, Ashwin. Nice to meet you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's okay. Unfortunately, I have to do That's okay. Yeah, open the Good. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Good, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. A very warm greeting to each and every one of you. Distinguished the Dean of School of Architecture, Planning and Policy Development, ITB, and Program Directors, distinguished speaker and student participants of today's public lecture. Welcome to the SAPPD International Public Lecture on the topic of urban level livability indicators and climate readiness, lesson and failures from Australian Metropolitan Planning. I am Salsa Bilanu Hanifa, the MC for this event. To begin this session, let us hear the welcoming speech from the Vice Dean of Academic Affairs, SAPPD. Please welcome Dr. Aswin Indraprasta. Okay. Uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, good afternoon, yeah, uh, students and also uh, Associate Professor Andrew Bud from RMIT. Very welcoming uh, to our SAPPD, yeah, uh, uh, Professor. We are very glad that uh, we have uh, some uh, foreign academicians that uh, uh, come to our school and deliver a public lecture that uh, hopefully uh, beneficial to our students. So again, uh, thank you very much for your coming and uh, this this topic, yeah, about the. Uh, Livability index is the uh, very important uh, topics nowadays. So uh, these are uh, our uh, graduate students. Yeah, if I'm not mistaken, uh, undergraduate and graduate student. I hope uh, uh, later on uh, many students will come. Yeah, join this this uh, very rare opportunities. I think. <laughs> uh, yes, uh, I have very short uh, time because yeah, you know the, the administrative works. <laughs> Uh, so uh, I, I also uh, 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 give our dean warm regards because uh, she cannot uh, attend this this uh, lecture because uh, uh, she has another class. 
Uh, so without further ado, yeah, uh, let's uh, start our guest lecture, and uh, we do hope that uh, all students can raise question and also uh, have a maximum benefit uh, from uh, Professor Andrew here. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you again. <laughs> Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, Dr. Aswin, for this speech. And let's move to the next agenda. For today's activities, we we'll receive a lecture by Professor Andrew Butt from the Royal Melbourne Institute of Technology University for 20 minutes and have a deep discussion related to the topic for the second 20 minutes. The discussion will be led by our moderator, Dr. Bagas Putra. Before we start the class, uh, let me introduce first our moderator, Dr. Bagas Putra Ramadan is a lecturer and assistant professor in urban and regional planning at ITB. For these past few years, he has done remarkable research focusing on urban planning and urban design. Please welcome Dr. Bagas Putra. Thank you, uh, Ibu Salsa, for the warm uh, welcome. Uh, today, I will present to you, in front of you, there's already a speaker from Melbourne, Australia. So Associate Professor Andrew Bud. Uh, before that, before he uh, start his presenta presentation, I will uh, read his CV or resume. So Dr. Bud started uh, his career as a lecturer in planning uh, at Urban uh, Dublin Institute of Technology, and then after that uh, he moved to Latrobe, and then now he's a uh, Associate Dean of Sustainability and Planning at RMIT University. Dr. Bud also has an extensive research uh, related to planning and also transportation planning, if I'm mistaken. And then he also uh, one of the researcher at Center of Urban Research uh, at RMIT University. Uh, and give a warm welcome to Dr. Andrew Bud, or Associate Professor. <laughs> Sorry. Thanks. It's okay. Thanks, thanks both for your warm well, welcome. And yeah, please, if you need to leave, please do. It. It's fine. Um, as was suggested, I'm, I'm going to be talking about issues of urban livability, indicators of urban livability, some work we've been doing in Australia at RMIT University, but also trying to pull apart some of the problems of of using those kinds of ways of seeing the city as data. Um, what we're missing when we do that, and what we need to think more about. So some opportunities for research that utilize that sort of work, but also some opportunities for research that interrogate how useful that sort of work can be for policy impact, for understanding the city and for understanding the lived experience of being in the city, the people. Um, have I got, um, possibly get a slides up for my, here we go. I have some slides. I'll, I think I've got control of them too in a second. Yeah, maybe. Do I have control? I thought I did. Um, is is that what thing plugged into this right thing? Because I'll just. Oh, look at that. No, did I do that? Oh, maybe it's the wrong computer. Oh, yeah, there we go. Okay, sorry about that. Um, well, this, you've got me to where I was going to go to anyway. So. I um I wanted to talk about some the role and purpose of some urban indicators and, and talk particularly about some work I've been doing um with others at our research center around indicators of of you know what might be termed livability. Uh, I want I, I promised at the end we'd talk about climate and I sort of didn't get up to that, but we I think we should because I think if we start to think about what they what the promise of that kind of um data-driven way of seeing the city is, we can start to see some of the opportunities it presents for models and scenarios of the future of uncertainty under climate changes, but as well as that, possibly some of the ways it, it has these models have difficulty capturing um, notions of, of self-derived resilience, notions of slow burn, as well as rapid disaster management, uh, and vulnerability. I, I don't feel they're very good ways necessarily to try and understand relative vulnerability of different communities and different people. So we'll talk a little bit about that. I wanted to talk about um, the sorts of settings we might see where they're used, and I'll talk to, to some Australian examples. And I've got a, an example of the Australian Urban Observatory, which is a, 
a, a livability modeling and indicator initiative within our own research center. And I'll show you a video of that um, to look a very short video of that to look at. Um, I've just been for a week in, in Ho Chi Minh City in the Mekong Delta region. And we've been talking about ways to think about the utility of those models in a setting like Ho Chi Minh City. And we have done some work, similar work in Bangkok, looking at ways to try and make them locally contingent, but you know, with some mixed success, which we can talk through. Uh, and the objectives and promise of this sort of stuff, what, why would we do it? So then I thought the last thing is we can talk about what it might mean if we're teaching planning, particularly when we start about, think about teaching planners um, ways to use all the data that's possible. You know, and, and we think about, we're in an era now where the, the possibilities of the data that we can use about analytics of the city are increasing so much. So to teach and research with that work means we've got to be quite cautious, I think, about uh, understanding what it is we want to use and why. Uh, and in some respects, we're coming back full circle to a very old model of, of planning that many of us are familiar with, just from textbooks and the like, of, of a highly comprehensive data-driven model of planning that, that we're reasonably sceptical of. But we're in an era now where that data is easily attainable and e easily achievable and we probably need to, to ask questions about how useful it is in in providing evidence for policy um so what do you do with indicators and by these sorts of indicators i'm talking about ways that we use data and data points to provide not simply facts and ideas for somewhere but rather measurable benchmarks um, and so there's a difference here when we think about indicators of city success, and we, we can see them all around us, indicators of um, comparative city livability at a, at a global scale or indicators of, or indicators and benchmarks of success in certain fields of economic and um, livelihood development, obviously measured against goals that we might be familiar with like the SDGs or goals around economic success. But, but these sorts of indicators I'm su suggesting are usually aggregate data sets, which are not simply given the role of being, uh, of presenting some sort of facts from institutional um, data sources, but rather given the role of promoting or benchmarking levels of success and comparative success. Um, they've got a performative agenda. They necessarily are usually geared and framed, not as abstract evidence, but rather they admit that they're they're suggesting that there's quite um, you know, a normative stance as to what would be better and benchmarking how those things will be better. And I think that's that's okay. That's interesting. It's an interesting job for um, the sorts of research impact that we see more and more um, with researchers not simply presenting their data as neutral objects, but rather as something which attempts to influence policy and attempts to present itself as part of public debate. So these are things which can be easily kind of um, constructed as an infographic and put out in social media, for example. And that's useful right now in, in academia too, to try and suggest that there's a, a value to that. They've also, you know, they're obviously tools with a, a good value, a, a good capacity for transferability because the indicator sets that might be derived from se a series of proxy data that's available in any given setting can cope with fuzzy data, can cope with data from various sources that derived remotely and derived locally. And so, so global measures of things like livability, which we'll look at in a minute, are very often um, those which are derived from um, very, very varied data sources from different kinds of different places. The question as to whether they're culturally appropriate or culturally specific is one we can debate in our discussion afterwards. But nonetheless, the sorts of examples we see are examples which um, bring together or aggregate sets of data which are quite easily able to be replicated or or best matched in replication in other cities. And so the uh, the temptation then to try and use these across places becomes quite strong, particularly for government um, and for, for multinational institutions too. And there's possibilities for that, but again, I'll caution on the use of that sort of thing. And of course, you know, it, it is a growing trend from the 1990s onwards. Uh, the idea that that um, the indicators as tools of um, of city success, particularly, and sort of you know global city success, 
um, has become very strong in the last decade and a half or so. Um, and the um, and I think that there is that idea that there's there's a uh, a sense that we still desire an evidence based decision making tool set. Um, even in era and, and certainly in urban policy, in an era where we've lost faith in many of the more comprehensive models of of plan and survey that were once dominant dominant forms of of urban policy. So, so there, there's obviously varied approaches. I want to talk a little bit about livability indicators, livability, health and well-being type indicators in particular. Um, and obviously, there's indicators of economic success and the like. But but those holistic models of what's livable. And how livability is is framed and understood, um, which is of course highly culturally contingent, um, but it's a it's a desirable framing of the sets of data I'm talking about in many cities around the world, um, and of course things like sustainability challenges are tied in with those usually, uh, and quite strongly, um, and I'm sort of saying that what they do is operational uh, operationalizes a sort of broad set of of um, knowledge which is highly focused in particular directions of saying how do we improve things the temptation for policy makers is of course that they become ready sets of of data or measures or spatial descriptors and data that they can see change over time or see comparative change between so it's, that's useful it's useful to get the sort of work that we're interested in onto the table of government too um I thought there was more images already, but there's not. I'm just stepping through these things still. I won't be long, I promise. So, um, so urban livability indicators, which I want to talk about to start with, uh, um, and many of you might be quite familiar with the sorts of models of urban livability indicators, and we can talk a little bit about what the can the sort of cultural context of these are, what the context of data availability is, and the representation of data at different scales, uh, and and how this works, but. But typically, we're talking about bringing together spatial, environmental, and socioeconomic factors. So, looking at the characteristics of place and the way people inhabit and use use these places, and then there's a sort of factors that are driven by what's available to actually try and understand. Um, it's really about getting aggregate data together is is usually the model too, and so bringing together vast and aggregated data into into small and sort of understandable sets. And the black box behind that is often something that doesn't always get questioned very well. Um, but the, the sort of work we're looking at do, does things like looking at um, distance of jobs or services, the characteristics of place that make them feel safe for incidental activity like walking, exercise, um, the, the way in which the urban environment and, uh, and nature in the urban environment interacts with people's use of it. And that'd be three kind of core characteristics of the sort of work we've been doing in Australian cities. Uh, and there's probably some universal characteristics to those things and probably some which are very dependent on the place we're in. But certainly that's the sort of work we, we've been using. And I'll show you some um, of what we've been doing at RMIT. And these are, these are now hard to read, sorry. These are some, and I've got a video in a minute, so I'll show you the links to these. But these are some mapping, for example, of of an urban livability index. So an indicised model of of about uh, eighty different characteristics for place, describing relative urban livability within Australian metropolitan cities. When we look at the the graph later, you'll be able to see it in more detail. But for, frankly, what it's really showing is that urban livability is significantly greater in inner urban areas of Australian cities than it is in in outer fringe suburban sites, which are difficult to access, uh, difficult to access jobs and services, difficult to access mature urban environments with the the services and um, you know characteristics of of um, urban design that older older areas have, for example, uh, and that seems reasonably straightforward. Uh, this is a map of um, a social infrastructure index as one component of the work and i'll show you a video on the australian urban, uh, urban observatory at the end but the green is good and the pink is bad basically and it's again showing you where you've got access to, to social infrastructure now what people do with that social infrastructure and whether they need it is of course of interest to me i've been doing a lot of work in the fringe of australian cities trying to understand how increased provision of social infrastructure may or may not lead to its use or its effective use particularly in new growing suburban communities um, 
and again, that's again very culturally specific. But but the point is that we know that we can understand these sorts of indicators of of access, but we know that that doesn't necessarily mean the quality of the the experience of being there and using it as an individual, you know, as an individual agent or a household is necessarily great. I'll I'll show a video of this stuff in a second. Uh, and of course, the work we're interested in is trying to connect indicators that we're doing quite specifically to things like sustainable development goals you know, and trying to use them as a framework. So as a top-down framework to tell us what what improvements and the, if you like the good life looks like and then trying to find things that fit our, our characterization of those different sorts of indicators. And, and I'd argue that this last work we did um, fits these these kind of SDG goals, for example, to try and tie together health and and work and livelihoods and sustainable cities and the quality of of environments ideally it's also perhaps maybe it's not solving um, SDG number 10 but it's certainly indicating to us how far we might have to go if we understand the spatial inequities within the city um, which will appear in many other cities too and it's quite stark the spatial inequities around access to to jobs and services in particular in Australian cities. We've tried and applied this work elsewhere. So this is from Bangkok uh, and where we back from about 2018 doing some work with Bangkok metropolitan region governance to try and understand what might be some measures of livability that would matter in Bangkok as a, as a, a city with quite different, a different set of social and economic circumstances to, to those in Melbourne where we first trialled the model. Um, and here we're looking at, you know, again, things like urban population densities as a measure of both good and bad. I mean, in Australian cities, trying to increase urban densities is seen to be a good planning goal because it brings about efficiencies in transport. It brings about efficiencies in land use goals and the like. There's plenty of parts of Bangkok where, in fact, declining, to, trying to decrease urban densities is is considered to be a goal, particularly around places where overcrowding and congestion are the fundamental problems. So you can see a, a sort of a, a measure like urban density having a very different set of um, outcomes or a different a different qualitative um, you know, scope within their, their modeling. Urban environmental issues like the middle one, which is around uh, vegetation, the presence of vegetation, which is stronger on the fringes of the city and highly connected to things like air quality and urban heat effects in the city at various times of the year. Uh, but also things like, the, it also in Bangkok is strongly indicative as it would be in other Indonesian cities too, strongly indicative things like permeable surfaces and managing managing flood regimes and, and water regimes. So, so it becomes an indicator of those and of waterway health. And the bottom one, which is around, uh, in this case, um, nitrogen dioxide, so, so a measure of air quality which again, you'd, as you'd know, is a fairly um, important factor of livability in many Indonesian cities as well, so understanding air quality in different parts. And so here we've got um, the yellow color in the center, um, meaning quite high levels and effectively low levels of air quality and, and higher, quality, higher air quality on the fringe as you would anticipate through traffic management issues. So, so it also brings in obviously a range of ways we can use you know, remote sensing as well as remote sensing for data, um, you know, Internet of Things, little kind of various um, monitors, city monitors for air quality and temperature and all those sorts of things, which is great allure to such things. So I'm not for a moment dismissing the idea we do this. I think this is important. I think it's important work to try and do. I think what we've got to try and work on, particularly if we start to have an international agenda for how we use these things is to try and understand what it is we're measuring and what it means in particular places. Um, this is a a policy brief, a policy brief to government and the public about the use of livability indicators in Australian cities. Again, to try and part of the agenda of of a livability indicator model is to make digestible and understandable work. So most of the message I get from urban planners, for example, is I can't penetrate that research.
it's too boring. I won't read it. And unless you make it easy for me to understand, no one else in my organization will read it either. So, so then our objective then becomes, well, how do we actually construct ways for this to be useful and easy to, mon easy to monitor and understand? And so things like a policy brief like this, which are simple two-page descriptions of what's important and why become quite important mechanism for us to, to validate the work we do in the public mind, through social media, uh, and into government and other forms of traditional media. And so, so it's, so I don't think we should shy away from the fact that that's a very important part of the research is to make research, which people can, can use and use quite simply. So there might be some trade-offs there for how comprehensive we are in the ways we we think about the research as meaning too, though. And I think that's important. So I'll get to the point of the problems. I've got more batteries, excellent. I'll get to some points of what I want to present as some problems, which I think if we can talk about these, maybe in our discussion after I've shown you the video, um, it might be a point we can discuss why, what sort of work people are doing. And maybe people here are doing work which could loosely fit in this sort of idea of thinking through um, sort of spatial indicators of something, um, particularly spatial indicators of things like livability within the city or well-being in the city or environmental health within the city. Um, in my mind, one of the issues is the role of this data. So, so the idea of informing policy or or influence the public, or in fact testing data and scenarios is really important. So the idea that we can we can use this um as ways to test and uh, test scenarios of future change and actually um, try and describe the, the policy impacts of, of particular what uh, particular approaches is important but but the fact that we can kind of reduce it to uh more simple and digestible forms than traditional scenario planning models or vast multi-criteria scenario planning models is useful absolutely useful and it actually it absolutely has impact um whether these are delayed or real-time models if you like delayed from past modeling or real time i think the the opportunity here is that we look at clever ways to make this um, utilize var a variety of things which actually bring them together um so you're bringing together uh, official data sets like census material or or historical traffic counts or whatever it might be with real-time data that's remote sensed or sourced from the internet. Uh, and, and those things are possible to bring together and in fact, choose the best indicator or the, the best data set for an indicator at the moment that you need it. Uh, and so working on models that do that is important, an important part of the work. I think one of the issues that really I do want to raise is of course, how contingent they are for culture and place. So I, I raise the example in Bangkok of thinking through density for where de we want more or less density, depending on the nature of a city as it exists. Uh, and of course, for whom, you know, who, who's actually gaining from this? And of course, the critique of a lot of livability indicator work that's undertaken commercially is those sort of global rankings and the like, which are fairly solidly focused on a particular experience of the city, um, of a, a globally mobile professional class, um, which is really not very helpful for us to understand the lived experience of being in the place for anybody. Um, and I do wonder sometimes what's masked in the process. This is the the nature of, you know, how, how much of an agent-based model can you have? How much can you understand the experience of individuals in models like this? How much can you understand the behaviour people undertake or the behaviour they would undertake given the opportunities to do things differently? How much can you understand the behaviour of people to live in environments with with particular characteristics that you might deem as undesirable when they're trading off other costs and possibilities about why they live in particular environments. How, how much can we understand the um, the political desire of people to make their city different to what it is now compared to the sort of choices people are able to make or the politics of those choices? And of course, a really big challenge, which I think is something which reminds us again, as I mentioned at the beginning, reminding us of what the opportunities that big accessible and open data sets um, offer us, which is they offer us that opportunity to start to think about the city, to visualize the city as a, or, or to see the city as a set of visualized facts, in fact, 
you know, that the city itself is the is the representation of these facts as they're described in coloured dots on the on a map. Um, that's tempting, and it's always been tempting for planners because we like maps and we think this data is good and we think we just need to influence people to kind of believe us. But by doing that, by by seeing the city in those visualised facts terms, we're, we're often really missing what's going on in people's lived experience. And it's a, a temptation which has been around in planning for a century. And now suddenly we've got a lot of data that we can use and we've got to avoid replicating those same mistakes as we go through them with the temptation to do all the things we now can do with spatial representations. And of course, I, also, I often ask the last question. I've got, in fact, got a PhD student doing this very thing, which is to try and understand what on earth constitutes evidence for policymakers anyway. Like when, when do facts and information like this, what claims do they need to make or what information do they need to effectively constitute evidence that could make a difference? And that can be quite difficult, you know, to sort of, to to we know that that the the political process of decision making doesn't rely very strongly on the 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 sorts of evidence we think should matter so so i think in some respects this takes us a bit closer to providing evidence that might matter but but when then we've got to sit you know the, the very epistemological question of well how much compromise have we made to to make this information digestible in order to construct that impact is one we need to ask so a few questions for teaching and research, and then I'll, sh I'll get you to show that video uh, and if, if I can. Um, I think we could have these discussions later. These are perhaps questions for you guys. Um, how do we think about teaching with data and evidence like this? How do we think about teaching with ways for students to sort of be influenced, to, to be rigorous, but also um, to potentially provide ways for people to do things which are easy and digestible and understandable? That goes for most things we do, but I think it particularly goes for ways we interpret um, the variety of available data sets for socio-spatial representation, like indicators of livability would do. Um, I think we've got really strong opportunities for policy influence and impact in research. So in people's you know, developing PhD programs and the like where people actually go out in a project and look to make a difference uh, as well as write their thesis. Um, but of course, it's limiting and frustrating because we've got lots of people in our program who kind of say, but like, why does no one listen to this? Look at this map. It tells you what it should be like. And you're thinking, yeah, the world doesn't really work like that. Um, that's very frustrating for, for young students too, at times, to be confronted with the fact that their work, as good as it is, isn't doing the things they think it should do. And, and, um, and I think there's really good scope in research for ways to bring together so many different sources of data and, and testing it over different sorts of cities to find the way things can work. So looking at some work we've been doing um, for around Delhi, trying to, to understand a place where they're really on the fringes of Delhi. There just is no institutional data about most of these things. It, it's about remote sensing and using things like Street View to try and understand uh, environments. Um, compared to cities where there's lots of you know rigorous collection of data at, at property levels and the like and, and everything in between so i think there's a lot of scope for research which tries to understand how we can take models like this and then get the best the best available data at any given time for any particular place i think there's work in that that's worth doing um, and of course we need work which looks at this critically it starts to look critically at, at how useful this is, starts to look critically at how um, urban policy and urban studies work has impact or doesn't. And that gap between information and evidence, and evidence and policy. So really encouraging people to think about things like that as, as legitimate areas of, of research in and of themselves, the research of the governance of, of evidence to policy. Uh, and so I think there's some really interesting work there to take the the large and growing sets of empirical work about um you know city analytics if you like in their biggest sense but livability indicators is one example and to actually understand what influence like they, they can and do have in in various policy circumstances so can i ask um oh, hang on just stopped on me if you can go forward one 
I just had a couple of readings you can have at the end. No, you've taken it back. Yep. Um, few readings. Second one's got me in it. Third one doesn't, but it was about the um, stuff from Bangkok. First one's a link to the AUO, and I'm about to show you a video of the AUO. Um, so if you can put that on with Mel, um, Melanie Davin, who's my colleague, talking. Um, it was a YouTube link, I sent you. And it only goes for a minute or two. And then we can do some discussion, I hope. The Australian Urban Observatory is your map to livable cities. It's a groundbreaking digital platform that transforms complex data into visual and easily understood domains of livability mapped across Australia's largest cities. The Australian Urban Observatory measures livability across cities, council areas, suburbs and neighbourhoods, helping decision makers to take action that improves the health and well-being of our communities. Let's say you're a policymaker who's trying to find ways to improve the livability of your city and encourage an active and healthy lifestyle for your residents. You can easily understand the walkability of an area, as well as access to schools, public transport and public open spaces to help decide which areas of people need resources the most. You could even look at other neighbourhoods and suburbs across the country to find out what is working in comparable geographic or demographic areas. Or maybe you're a developer looking for the next place to invest. You can start by looking at indicators of housing, employment, access to shops and community services at a suburb level, and then narrow down to individual neighbourhoods. Here, you can determine exactly which area is ready to welcome more people. You might be learning about livability at school. The Australian Urban Observatory is a unique interactive teaching resource that shows what livability looks like and how it can be measured and improved. Or maybe you're just interested in learning more about your city and neighbourhood. The Australian Urban Observatory can be used by everyone, providing access to a resource that's supported by years of evidence-based research at RMIT University. We've made understanding livability so much simpler. We've taken data out of the tables and put it on the map. We're supporting observation and understanding, leading to action that improves livability. With the Australian Urban Observatory, you can see a real world view of how this information exists in our cities and where we can change urban design and planning to really influence the health and livability of Australian cities. The Australian Urban Observatory, it's your pathway to livable cities. This one's back on. Yeah, cool. All right. So, so okay. There's a few things in that, of course, and, and Mel's a friend of mine, but and colleague, but that that sort of document is very much framed at the sort of marketability of that tool, particularly to local government planners who are sort of seeking their own ways of, of kind of constructing arguments and evidence in their own neighbourhoods. Um, but the, the the principal idea, of course, being that there's good ways to visualise what's going on in places and to understand which places are better than others under a range of factors. Um, there's a lot of work behind that justifying why, at least in Australian context, the sorts of indicators they're using are good indicators of health and wellbeing, particularly health, um, particularly those. But then, you know, in many instances, they're, they're also just measures of socioeconomic wellbeing. And, and I'm always slightly sceptical that simply improving the urban environment is always going to lead to improvements in socioeconomic well-being you know i mean this is the the great sort of spatial determinist debate of planning that's been around for a long time as though making someone's environment healthy necessarily overcomes poverty and dependency issues and you know having a job in a in a part of the economy which is just structurally disappearing or whatever else it might be um so there's challenges in that thinking um, and certainly the people involved in the team that i work with that mostly come from a health 
public health background, but we have those debates quite often. Um, but I think nonetheless, it, it, it presents itself as very digestible work to try and influence policymakers for the sorts of things we think matter around what a good city looks like. And, and so I'm very happy to be part of that process. I think it, it just does require discussion. But I thought for a set of questions we might, I wanted to, I was sort of interested in how many people here actually doing research work, which sort of involves city data analytics type work and how you kind of frame that work in terms of what you intend its impact to be, whether it's about livability or not, um, how you frame that work in, in its intention and its sort of digestibility um, in the public realm and in for for policymakers, and also what might what might it take to kind of try and um, can create, I suppose, useful um, spatial analytic data in those terms. Is anyone much doing work in that sort of area of spatial analytics work, or you? Yeah. Well, you're behind the desk. <laughs> so, um, I don't know if we want to have a discussion about this, but what, what sort of work are you doing from a spatial analytics point of view? Um, sometimes I do the landfill analysis using the spatial analysis, yeah. so we can identify uh, the land value in some areas, which is the higher one, which is the lowest one, so we can give the recommendation later to government or for the investors to do. Um, Beside that, we also like um doing another like um what do we call it um the dukum a carrying capacity of the area of the cities so we can give the recommendation later to the uh, special planning also so yeah sometimes I did that and and is anyone else doing any sort of special analytic work analytic work like that as part of the projects really? Or well, wanting to, because the other thing I wanted to, to ask you guys about perhaps more readily was as urban planning experts here in Bandung and in Indonesian cities generally, what might be good measures, spatial measures of a livable city here? Now, we had a good debate in Ho Chi Minh City on Monday. We were talking about how do we understand heat and shade? How do we understand access to nature? Yeah, you know, I don't know if many people have been to Ho Chi Minh City, but there's not a lot of nature there. You know, people don't see nature in the same terms as uh, certainly a city like this. And I know that might be different again when you go down, you know, to Jakarta and stuff. But the, there's a stark absence of nature in Ho Chi Minh City, and and what green spaces there are are almost constructed to sort of avoid being natural, right? So, so the sort of the the idea of access to an open space where you might, I don't know, congregate is a very different thing to, to access an open space where you might take in nature. And, 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 and separating those things out is a really important way of understanding different things about the city, which is a very, you know, quite culturally contingent sort of example. Has anyone got any thoughts on what, a, what might be a sort of a, a, a measure of livability in a city like Bandung that you could spatially apply? Yeah, we do. We have things like whether the footpaths are good quality or not. I don't think it matters to you. <laughs> you know, I suppose I was just thinking of examples that might be quite different if you're going to come and try and apply a a model, a spatial model like this to a city like Bandung. You'd you'd need to probably think through a, a series of criteria about what the lived experience is. Obviously, things like congestion and points of and and time taken to travel rather than distance is really important an important distant difference no one talks around here about distance they talk about time when they you know and that's a common thing in indonesian cities i've noticed we talk about distance for, to a place and it's assumed the time will be kind of roughly linear to that you know and then people will understand that um but there might be other differences have you got any you can think of you didn't invite me. I'm going to put you on the spot now. Uh, okay. Is there any questions? Or... Well, examples or even examples like that. Is, like, is there any answer from specific, everyone? Specific indicators of visibility that we might see here. Mm -hmm. 
Those of housing quality are interesting as well. What people expect from housing. Yeah. So, uh, actually, I did. Uh, I have a few uh, experience to the Lebak Siliwangi. It's a housing settlement, but for informal area. So we found it uh, different different indicators for the special special uh, livability there. So uh, we can uh, we couldn't compare it to the formal uh, forms, but it has a unique their own uniqueness for the informal area. So the student found it, they have a different kind of public space that make it more livable. And for the street and alleyways also, it doesn't fit the standard for from the SNE Indonesia, but it has uh, their own standard that can make a uh, movement and uh, like mobility there uh, still going on. It's like that. So, and uh, if we compare it to the another kampung in Indonesia, Lebak Silewangi has uh, a higher level for the uh, level of uh, livability than the other kampung. So, uh, they, um, they work with their own community and the local you know, for uh, from the local governments until their own citizen. So, they work to make the kampung more livable and pretty if you want to go there uh, so uh, the environment they uh, paint all of the their walls so it's more fun and uh, children friendly also that's good. Quite, quite difficult to try and measure spatially yeah um, without some sort of criteria of like particularly around the accessibility of spaces or something and they become very difficult criteria to try and comparative measure. I suppose the others are just, um, I mean, the Bangkok example was that notion of you know, things like air quality, which is probably less important here than, than Jakarta, but things like, you know, how many days of air quality become quite important. And of course, I had, I've had a student who's just completed a PhD in Dakar, Bangladesh, and he, he's been looking at the way in which livability is sort of understood and interpreted through policy there. And and again, there's very strong influence from models of um, more international models that don't really apply very well, uh, and 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 a very strong distant difference between people's aspirations for what a livable city is, and ways you might understand the city as it exists, particularly as the city kind of suburbanizes and a lot of new housing and apartment developments are being con constructed. So, so there's a very stark difference between a, the representations of a livable city. And the way that particular, particularly successful areas do livable cities, if you like, and that, that there's just, it's just significant differences to try and understand um, for policymakers and for people living there. So there's there's problems in trying to apply a model like that to a place like that. Has anyone else got any questions or comments on to make? Because we we're coming up to one thirty too. Yeah, Dr. sure. How do you? Yeah, I think livable is something that can be, uh, you know, a, a, every person perhaps can have a different meaning of livable. Well, if, if we talk about city, we say, is Cairo livable or not? Then how we really measure that? The fact is that Cairo has been there for more than 3,000 years, and people are there and <laughs> crap like this. <laughs> It's livable or not. So I think that's the problem when we want to, you know, make it all the same, right? Perhaps we can see uh, uh, Chicago, is it is it livable or not? And we compare with Melbourne or Sydney. Well, then I think that's uh, the difficulties or the challenge when we want to have the data that can be comparable, right? Unless we make a standard international livability index or something like that then yeah yeah that's uh, that's then then we, we can yeah i i think i think that's uh, going to be uh, the challenge and even more difficult when we uh, say make a city a new city a livable then we have to think livable for whom who will be? because when you show the uh, australian i think you show 
if we want to be a, a livable, uh, what is it? Uh, housing is there. If if a uh, um, university or, or, or education is there, something like that, right? So I think that's really the challenge. Yeah. We will make a new city now. <laughs> That's the challenge now. Yeah. I agree with you about fire out and yeah, that, that example, but, but there's some ex there's some extent to which say the bank office that what interventions can we make to actually improve things like access to nature and improve air quality? I mean that, that's still what planners want to do, right? And if if livability becomes the framing narrative that works, it works in policy, then the answer is still how do we make this place like, healthier? Which I still think is a good um, role for planning to take. Now, whether the whether the use of those resources will be in, and that's certainly what the PFC is doing. Um, you know, the use of the idea of ideas and words that we're looking at their own kind of problems. Um, but but I think the, the goal is still the same is to have like that water quality and air quality and and safety on the street a good idea. Yeah. And I still think they were doing um now, if we need to kind of hold them with the building, we have to make that sensible to, to local policy makers to look at the zones and whatever else, and maybe that's a compromise. Yeah. 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 There's also a, a sense, uh, 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 what is it, uh, term of sensible city. When you are sensible city, is something that, well, it's a livable city. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. But as you point out, we live in other yeah, I had a question because uh, I did research before I get my uh, PhDs here that um, my research is about a small island. In the northern Jakarta, it's a dense small island. When we talk about livable city, my head thinks that we need the public green areas and so on and so on. But when I ask them, the population in a small island, a dense small islands, they don't need open space. They're surrounded by open space water. They don't need green areas yeah. because when I when I said that you need green areas because you need water. Right, you need clean water, mm -hmm. and they said that uh, this island cannot contain water. Yeah. We got water from the rain, yeah. so it's probably the indicators is too reductionist for me. If I applied it the small islands, mm -hmm. what do yeah. you think about that? Yeah, I, I mean, I think that's a really good example where clearly the the way in which you would actually try and measure that or improve it. I mean, what do you, uh, the, the fundamental question is what would you be measuring it for in a place like that? And, and what, and, and if you need it, if you needed ways to sort of legitimize improvements in that place, then maybe that's what it does. But the, but to try and construct a set of sort of uniform indicators of livability for a place that doesn't have that problem. And it's a little bit like the identifying the, the differences in particular, um, particular neighborhoods that have got very specific ways of using public spaces i mean they're not very useful in those in that way as well but I, but i do think that they we shouldn't underestimate the utility and this is the this is the great question for us i suppose as academics yeah how much are we willing to to buy into a, a narrative that makes sense in policy terms um but at the same time recognize that there's strong limitations to it and this is this is the tension between have, um, between doing research and having impact, I suppose. Um, I, I suspect, obviously, the obvious thing to do in that instance is ask people what they want. But then there's also, you know, have you seen alternatives? This is always a, a fundamental question for any community. Um, but the main thing I suspect is that we need to constantly ask ourselves when we've got access to so much data um, and so many comparable models we need to ask ourselves why would we be doing this for and and is it worth simplifying and communicating these ideas because of the the possibility we get good outcomes for you know improving water or air quality or improving traffic access or whatever it might be for a place versus 
oversimplifying and reduce, as you said, running a reductionist model that just suggests there's no difference between places. I think I don't know where the answer lies, but it's a question you have to keep asking. Yeah, for sure. Well, and even in, in the example of the 22 Australian cities we ran, I mean, I I think that there's a lot of examples there where the the differences, and it's discussed in the paper that I gave you there, the differences between them is such that even in a place with some fairly similar cultural contexts, the differences are quite significant about, um, you know, people's perception of travel, people's perception of what's close, people's perception of what's what's good, you know, in a big city versus a smaller city, what they're there for, people's views about access to nature, what 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 they use nature for, what what they think it's for, and of course, simple things like you know, air quality is just not a problem in some of those cities. Because, well, if you stay in in, in the uh, uh, what is it a forest area like uh, those who li living in 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 dense forest in Amazon or something they this they, they say that they they, they are uh, uh, happy to live there and it's livable for them but for us who is living in the city say that it's not livable although mm. to the nature the distance to the nature how they live is actually is very good right yeah no uh, pollution living with the nature uh, good yeah. health so i think that's the thing that we have to face when we say something we have to make a definition and yes. what is it and, and a, this... a lot of the material coming out so say north american cities sort of positions urban environments around things like safety you know and the real lack of safety in a lot of them too which is just a particular cultural context and a lot of the literature suggesting that perceptions of being safe in the city um, matter a lot that they're not really questions that are raised at all in Australian cities in the same terms it's just not the same kind of sense of you know risk and safety in the urban environment around particularly around violence you know so so there's strong framings about these things that suit particular places um, and yeah we deserve to question them every time but but the examples you've given are ones which are uh uh well outside norms and i think you know um important that we don't ever get into a trap of trying to suggest that they're they're useful across places but i'd still love to try and kind of you know look at a couple of indonesian cities and think about what is what are the features in in those in those large or medium-sized cities that actually could be factored in and the other challenge is of course what sort of data do you even have to make them make sense uh, and in, in situations where data is varied in quality and the like, you start to, you know, it's it's a good intellectual exercise to start to see what would make sense um, in those sort of settings too. Mine in, in uh, close to New York, a small a small city there. It's very nice, but there's no the people is very. I mean, population is very small. But it's li yeah. very livable. So then we can also have to see livable. Is it when it's livable? Is there any connection with the number of population or the or the number of jobs? Number of jobs. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, I think livelihoods is an important factor in most of these, and the very varied nature of, of livelihoods in in within cities is important here. Uh, we've seen just in recent times, you know, like people with work that they can do remotely or change the time of doing it and all the rest of it and people who don't have that circumstances you know has shown really stark differences in in health you know health outcomes really obviously so that's that's a big symbol of of how you know distance and access and work can be a vastly different experience for people in the same city too all right so thanks guys for coming and um oh yeah all right sorry close it there andrew so how did australia come into this i mean how uh, how long did they learn i mean to understand the importance of livability and then what are the failures that australian yeah. cities face probably in the beginning well i suppose beginning? i mean i suppose in some respects this is a um much of this livability stuff has been from our from our style of doing it has been the product of a 
of a re-entry of health, public health issues into urban planning. And that's really a phenomena of the last sort of 20 or so years. Uh, public health thinking has got a long history in planning, particularly around, you know, water and sewerage and the like. But but the re-emergence of of um of public health thinking into urban planning from the the late not, not the late twentieth century, and and trying to understand the public health consequences of cities that um where people have got limited access to, you know a range of retailing where they've got limited access to sort of active lifestyles in particular in Australia, which is a big problem. Um, and the other is, um, I suppose, you know, which is the nature of sort of single use suburbia, which is a strong late 20th century model of urbanization in Australia. And the last is um, probably the way that people start to see public health issues of livability as being broader issues of things like social isolation um, or connectedness, um, which again are sort of parts of phenomena coming, particularly out of North America, around single-use suburban development. So, so a lot of it's derived from that. But equally, you can see that the commercial, you know, international commercial kind of models of livability, as well as, and we can get to the point I, I raised in the in the title, which I didn't get to, which is the urgency of thinking through sustainability challenges. And 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 the recognition that sustainability challenges are going to flip up some people's ideas of what that they're doing well and others have not. So so in Australian cities, things like energy costs for transport um, under um, climate mitigation policy, or in our case, things like urban heat, um, the um, disaster risk around things like fire and flood, they've become quite important measures of of urban environments and actually understanding vulnerability in an urban environment that's baked into the design um, has become a, a really they become really key factors in understanding livability. So you know, so we have um, well compared to here, we have much hotter weather sometimes, um, and we also have, um, like you, we have our share of sort of um, urban disasters, particularly flood and fire in the case of Australian cities. So, so trying to understand how you might measure the lived experience of a place and also the resilience of a place so those things have been really big drivers of of a of, of framing things as livability now whether why that's a politically convenient way to frame things is a part of a more international push in that regard but it's become a a useful way to describe um these kind of concerns um, in ways that very technical approaches about you know access to transport or access to work or whatever um, have never really had the same resonance. But talking about like the political goal of making cities livable is is something that's quite hard to argue against. Any questions? Uh, hello, sir. My name is Christopher. Uh, I'm from uh, first year student at Bandung Institute of Technology. You've mentioned before that uh, some urban livability indicators are bringing spatial, environmental, and socio-economic factors together. And some example of it are good health and well-being, reduced inequalities, uh, life on land, sustainable community and buildings, uh, etc. And if we look at the condition right now, the world is a dyna dynamic place. We've had pandemics. We have had uh, several natural disasters before. And uh, the recent one, uh, we our friends in Turkey and Syria are having a natural disaster as well. Uh, my question is, are these indicators adjustable according to the so condition uh, around us, or is it not adjustable? Yeah, no, I think I think so. And I think um, an interesting thing is that the the issue of disasters, you know, so we can understand vulnerability. You know, impact and vulnerability for people. I mean, obviously, something like the really sad events in Syria and Turkey are hard to fully understand. We can they can go back into you know whether they had good building regulations and everything else. But but the the notion of thinking about vulnerability to quick action things like flooding, in particular, would be a good example. Or perhaps it's a better example. Um, very much factors that we should be trying to build into models like this. The, the 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 slower burn disaster I think of of 
climate change and what it does to slowly change the livability of places like for example i mean you said cairo has been there for three thousand years or whatever but but there's many cities in the world which have been there for a long time but are just are adjusting rapidly or not daily but generationally to things like sea level rise and temperature i think trying to understand a impact and vulnerability to things which take a long time is going to be a trickier part of this um so if we start to look at things like daily temperature or or heat spikes or access to shade or air quality and how they gradually change over time and how much we can tolerate and how much we can't is going to be really interesting if a city like delhi where where air quality has been a problem for a long long time but now air quality is just a regular and consistent problem um you know, almost an unchanging problem is a good example of that where there's always been problems with air quality. It's always been a factor you'd include in a, a livability index. But now it's almost like it will just all be red forever. Um, what do you do with that information? I, I, I do wonder what you'd do with that information. Like what would be the policy decision? Move. You know, like it's kind of really challenging. But yeah, of course they're dynamic. But um, I think w there's a lot of opportunities to build in dynamic data. We've got real time data on so many things now. We can build into models. We, 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 yeah, you look at it on your phone, right? You look at traffic. So we've got real time data on so many things. The real question is how do we digest all that information? Because there's so much. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Kaisan. Uh, in the video, one of the target for your data is a K-12 student. I'm curious about how uh, you teach the children to understand the complex things like that. Yeah. Uh, what the purpose of the children to understand? So, so we do, um, they do a, that, that group. It's a couple of people who do quite a bit of outreach to kids. Um, and so that primary school kids as well, but also, so, so mostly it's a bit like public health education stuff. It's about trying to understand your environment and what it offers you. Um, for later high school kids, it's trying to convince them to do town planning, but, but also, um, um, you know, trying to get them to think about the environments they live in and what sort of inter interventions make a difference. You know, how, how would it be, how would this be a different environment if I felt safe around traffic or how would this be a different environment if I had better access to services around me um, and that sort of thing. So, so again, you know, I suppose showing people the sorts of planning issues we probably think are quite good in any environment. Um, but their argument is that it's reasonably digestible. So we, we ran a workshop a while ago where people used that data and then plotted where they went each day and how it fitted into the different and how, whether they agreed with the sorts of indicator differences that different neighbourhoods in their own area were showing. And were they understanding it differently? And so we we're testing how how 15 year olds use their neighborhood rather than how adults who are going to work might. Um, and we, it's interesting examples of what they were thinking about places they felt safe and unsafe. Um, there's a big project in in Melbourne in recent years talking about, you know, how how women feel at various public transport locations and doing a self-driven, you know, places you feel safe kind of model at different times of day too, and trying to map that in and see what it says about sense of safety under lighting particularly a sense of safety in different urban environments like like around railway stations at night things like that so i think asking different groups is really important because i mean obviously a, a critique of a lot of traditional planning models is that it's about the experience of adults going to work you know as though that's the measure of a good society so so a lot of the i mean a lot of the data used here is um, either remote sense data or, or things like, you know, um, you know, pathways and things, or just institutional data like census material. But increasingly, we're trying to use data that's crowdsourced. You know, how to, what's the experience people are having in places and what might be an indication of that? Harder to do because you get a particular cohort and you wonder who they are and do they, what do they represent? Yeah, just like I've had students doing a lot of work with students just doing things like looking at, like Google reviews for places, positive and negative Google reviews, and then trying to inter map and interrogate what it was that was making people feel good or not. Was it just about the shopping or was it about the experience of the place?
Yeah, you can things like that. Yeah, I mean they're useful, but you know, I think this the COVID shown us that some of those things aren't that useful. You know, because people do have done things differently the last couple of years, and a lot of traffic flows have been in in Australian cities have been quite disrupted from their, their previous norms, for example. But you know, I think that there's we've got so much data to use. And and but I still think it's worth asking fourteen year olds what they think about their city, for sure. Chat <laughs> stays Anyone from home? In the studio, over the forty at the moment. Who's that? Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> But there's a long tradition of playing with them, but they're really in the city and it will be livable on the moment. The later generations are going to. Why do you do that? <laughs> For example, our oh, camera is a nice place to visit. Am I in recording here? Yeah, it's a nice, it's a nice place to visit. I don't know. People in Canberra love it. <laughs> Rome, yeah, I know, but it's, it's still got its problems, though, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's got its problems, and it's got it's gone through good and bad times, and it's got still, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, lots of old cities like that. Yeah. Well, arguably, I mean, arguably that, yeah, I mean, arguably that the idea that, that, I mean, that's, that's part, I suppose that's part of the problem of a city like, like, like Australian, Australian cities since probably the 1960s or 70s have become increasingly sprawled and inaccessible. So goals, which try and reverse that, increase densities and increase access to services are seen as positive planning outcomes. We saw in the case of Bangkok that sometimes decreasing urban densities is actually seen to be a desirable thing. You know, so and that's my point, I suppose. That's 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 the contingency of place. Is, you know, and so so if we've got a goal to actually construct you know what to some extent a city like Jakarta has, which is to have multiple centers that that operate quite well and we don't have that in a city like ours, then you know, de decentralizing services and creating multiple centers is a, is a good goal. I mean, Ho Chi Minh City doesn't have that. A city like Manila just has that. You know, it's just got these sort of dispersed, decentralized locations. I mean, there's something in between. Um, so, I, I, again, I suppose it, it very much depends on the place and the circumstance and what what planning goals might be. Yeah. 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 Yes. 
and it's a small, very small city. It's a very small place, you know, and so it's it's a smaller population than here, I think. Um, yeah, yeah. So it's it's so Dublin's only one and a half. Yeah, yeah, and the the, the area around is probably, yeah, quite a yeah. It's about one and a half. So I mean, yeah, no, it's very it's very much contingent on the place, and I don't for a minute think there's, but I still think there's some underlying ideas like like you know air and water quality and safety in a place i mean i still think of fundamental ideas that that planning should aim to and i think um you know resolving the the vulnerability that places have to things like climate you know resolving the vulnerability that individuals have um i mean we were talking the other day in ho chi minh city about heat issues and we're describing urban shade and heat and a couple of people there saying well it's not really an issue here we're just used to it and that's but I said, you know, I said no. But I, I said, well, firstly, our our temperatures get higher. But I said one of the key differences in in an Australian city is the demographics are we've got lots of older people, and they are the ones that are vulnerable, you know. And so, and so in a city like Ho Chi Minh City, where pretty much everyone appears to be about twenty, um, maybe they don't feel that's a public health issue. But but in a in a society with a more aging population, that becomes a really visible an important public health issue. And I bet I bet in Ho Chi Minh City that old people are still vulnerable to the heat. I bet that 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 it, living conditions and um those sorts of issues still affect older people more than they affect young people. Uh it's just that the the demographics of the place don't make that a sort of a fundamental as fundamental and crucial an issue. So so there's issues in there about vulnerability of place and also of particular populations. That, that are worth trying to pull apart, as we said about young people, for example, before pulling those things apart is important. I'd say here in 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 your city here, accessibility for people with limited mobility is an issue to, to think about. What what makes this city livable for someone who's in a wheelchair? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I mean, I think, but I think that I think, um, you know, nat like how, where nature works in the city and what it does for the city is really important. And and whether that's nature as functional, like providing spaces for, um, you know, shade or flood management, but also, you know, yeah, sure. Um, you know, biodiversity in the city is really important in Australian cities. In fact, Australian cities, in and around Australian cities, are where we have some of the highest rates of biodiversity because outside of them often been stripped for farming and and the complex ecologies of the, in and around the city are actually the the remnants of some quite novel uh, ecosystems that have a range of species that that have been kind of removed from you know commercial agricultural regions surrounding them yeah And I suppose the argument would be if it's, it's a healthy city that has biodiversity and so and sort of you know linkages out landscape linkages out into nature, then that's probably a good sign for what the city might be for people too. Yeah, right. Got a mic. Uh, okay. Hello. My, hello everyone, my name is Raka. I think my question is a follow-up regarding to Christopher's questions. Like Christopher has stated that the world is a dynamic place. We can have big changes or events that are happening around us in a span of three, year, three years. Like the year now, 2023 is so different from 2020. Hmm. So what kind of methods do the policymakers and government bodies use to plan for the future? Let's say like 20 years from now on. Hmm to accommodate those livability factors yeah I, 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 in terms of this kind of work and what it can offer i'm interested in increasing interest in what this kind of work might offer for scenario planning uh, and i think um it's interesting i used to teach a course around kind of strategic planning where we talked about scenario planning and we talked about you know normative, normative scenarios you know where we want to get to and we talked about trend-based scenarios like where's the data taking us and then we used to say 
and now let's invent a sort of scenario. What if something happened? You know, and 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 no one and no one ever said, well, what if we had like a global pandemic and lots of borders were shut and people you know did this and that? Like I think once someone said something like that and everyone went, yeah, yeah whatever. But um, but the idea that we had actually a real life experiment in what would you do if you disrupted economies and public health systems and international travel and trade? We actually had that experiment, right? We we did it. So it so it sort of sort of suggests ways in which you could use data like this to model forward trends, but also model scenarios for policy interventions or economic change or or in fact public health restrictions that might show us a very fundamentally different way um, rather than rather than just following trends or having some desirable goal, but rather having scenarios for for an intervention or a scenario for an unexpected change. And I think um, to some extent, climate change threats, so although we know there's trends towards, um, you know, there's trends-based issues, we also know there's step changes that are uncertain and where scenarios for dramatic step changes in 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 temperature or sea level or the like might be things we, scenarios we then model. You know, the circumstances of livability in a city under a scenario where where sea level rise looks like this within a hundred years um, might be really interesting, or where t- where where regular temperatures over forty degrees become more common in you know, over these months, we could we could probably um, do a lot more to to show a livability model under those circumstances that that are really just scenarios of unknowns, and it wouldn't be hard to do, but it would be hard to agree on what they were. Our presentation or our discussion. Give a round of applause to Professor Andrew Bud. Sorry, I didn't notice that you're already professor since January 2023. <laughs> Sorry, Andrew. Huh? Being promoted. Congrats on your promotion. Okay. Uh now we've reached uh the end of our session. And then yeah, thank you very much. But before we close our uh presentation today, we would like to give oh, should I close or salsa? Okay, so we have uh, some goodie bags and then certificate to give to you, Andrew. And then we would like to welcome Professor Hario Winarso as the head of our Senate of our school to give uh, Professor Andrew the, the certificate and also the plague of our ITB and then also the goodie bags. So this is the, the ITB flag. Mau foto dulu Pak. Mungkin di tengah. Could you, yeah, move a little bit here in the center. None. Oh yeah, here, here is good. He's better. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. And second one is uh, the certificate. So we will change it probably. <laughs> That's okay. And because Andrew didn't tell me that he got promoted. <laughs> Thank you. And then mungkin foto lagi Pak dengan ininya. Punten. Ini saya. Let me let me take the plate. Oh, you want you know. Okay. Okay. And then lastly is uh goodie bags from our school. And then there's some batik probably yeah, a scarf. So you can give it to your partner or whoever you want to give. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. And for the last session, probably you can have a group pictures before we finish our session for today. Yeah, ke depan semua.
So next week Pak Saud bilang uh, rebuan as usual ya. Yeah. And, and I think there's cookies as well, uh, snacks that you can take. There's some snacks uh, that you can try, traditional.